Hey, boss listeners. Today, I'm chatting with Dylan Desmond from the Seattle doom metal band Bell Witch about Leo Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Ilyich. I just have to say, if you know Bell Witch and haven't read Tolstoy, or if you love Tolstoy and haven't heard Bell Witch, you should definitely cross those streams. They go together remarkably well. But before we get into conversation, let's listen to a little bit of The Unbodied Air off of Bell Witch and Ariel Ruin's new collaborative record, Stygian Bow, Volume 1. that Google hasn't heard before, I'm sure. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, we'll just get rolling. Okay, cool. Cool. So uh, for listeners who uh, probably know you in some context of being a musician, I'm curious, you know, what, what came first, being a reader or being a musician? Or can you even really separate them? Yeah, I don't really know how to separate them, I guess. Um, my dad is a musician, and I kind of grew up in bars that he'd be playing in but at the same time mm. my my mom was an english teacher <laughs> so and she was taking night class which is why i'd be at the bars with my dad so um <laughs> i guess in a sense they were kind of uh kind of parallels ah that's awesome you're actually like the like the perfect combination for this podcast then. well i think so too you you were bred for it <laughs> <laughs> i come from a long line of perfect subjects for this podcast <laughs> uh, so so given that like you know if you can't really separate them there's this concept of when you're writing or making music or creating art like that it is ultimately referential to something it's hard to back it out of influences how do you how do you roll with that do you think of things as being direct influences or do you try to create in a vacuum or just kind of what's your flow there I think it does go like it does follow in the line of whatever the person's influences are, because I just kind of try to go wherever my mind wanders to. And I think that most people probably do that. Maybe there's some intent and direction that they're trying to focus on. But even then, I would say that any and all of us kind of just go wherever the guidelines that we've created for ourselves are going to let us go to. Yeah. So this book that we're going to be getting into, Leo Tolstoy's Death of Ivan Ilyich, mm-hmm. how is this something that, you know, you arrived at when we were kind of exchanging, uh, you know, possibilities for the book to talk about? I know we, we threw out some Kafka and Le Guin yeah. and Sartre. You know, why is this the thing that, that stands out to you? Well, I guess the way that I came across this book was that I just saw it in, the, in a used bin at um, <laughs> Goodwill. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I've always wanted to read Tolstoy, but I think that War and Peace has always been a little too intimidating because it's huge. Yeah, it's a commit. Yeah. And um, the same with Anna Karenina, which I think I'm pronouncing that right. And, you know, this book's pretty tiny. It's only like 120 some pages. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to grab that. And I, ju- I just launched into it one night and I think that's something that I love about it, which made it kind of stand out from the rest, is how compact and how, how dense it is. Like, there's no flowery language. There's no elaboration of anything. Everything is very matter-of-fact and plainly stated. Mm-hmm. I, I like that about it. That's not to say that I'm not a fan of flowery language, because I love flowery language. But um, there's none <laughs> of that here, which is kind of great. It's just meat and potatoes. Yeah. And... uh that's great because I haven't read War and Peace or Anna Karenina either, which I think makes this kind of a blasphemous Tolstoy episode. Yeah, because what I understand is those <laughs> two are quite flowery. Exactly. So I guess as a disclaimer, it's possible that maybe we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> well, um, that would definitely be the first time for both of us, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I love when you like threw this out as an option because the first thing that comes to mind, like how I associate Tolstoy is kind of just like that expansiveness, but also, I mean, there's differences in expansiveness in prose versus expansiveness in subject matter, right? Mm-hmm. As you mentioned, this is this is definitely like one of his more compact things, but I think the breadth that he covers in this 
is really, really impactful. I was kind of amazed at that. Like I, he really did cover like an entire life, a whole trajectory, all the nuanced stuff built in, but in that super dense or rather super matter of fact type of approach. And that was kind of, I don't know, it just it was a perfect combination, I think, to associate with, you know, somebody who makes music that is very conceptually heavy, but at the same time, um, you know, has an expansiveness to it itself. So do you like, do you have a natural association with that? Do you, do you see overlaps between kind of what you're involved in with this book as well? Sure. I could, I can see that. Um, I guess something that like sp- specifically with, um, Bellwitch things, I'm definitely trying to, um, focus on things that are kind of like a slow burn as one might put it. Um, like let something kind of draw out a little bit, but mm-hmm. I want things to be very dense within that slow burn, like as drawn out as it is, I want there to be like subtle little points of importance throughout it, which I think is something he was definitely achieving in this book here. Every, everything seems very, uh, calculated and intentional. Yeah. And it's kind of like, uh, I mean, I feel like the word meditation is overused in a lot of these descriptions. Like it's a meditation of blank, but you know, this really is to me, it's the meditation of, you know, what it means to suffer. It's, it's what pain is. It's what death is. It's looking mortality in the face. Absolutely. And there's kind of, there's this cool thing that he does where he, you know, has the ability to kind of summarize these types of big arcs in a really simple statement. It's almost like a, like a introductory, like theme in a musical piece or something like that. It's like, he just drops it out there and then he uses that to expand beyond it. And one of the things so that I really, really liked, it's probably my favorite sentence in the entire book, is the beginning of chapter two, which is a really short sentence that just goes, Ivan Ilyich's life had been most simple and most ordinary and therefore most terrible. Yeah. And that's really, that's the whole book. It is. In the one sentence. And that just kind of floored me how concise that was. Yeah, it was very concise. And it something that it was wild to me was how how timeless this is. or i don't know maybe it 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 could very well be a contemporary novel um mm-hmm. like i i there's nothing in here that seems like it couldn't have been written in the past 20 years other than the idea that a, a judge is kind of a like a middle class person i wouldn't think of a <laughs> a judge that like i don't know lives in the united states as being someone of the what i would perceive as a middle class but um yeah the civil, the civil servant bracket. Sure, sure. That. Yeah, but it's, it's um, wild to think that this was written in like with the late 1800s when, the, you know, there were cowboys running around shooting each other in the in the wild west in the United States. Yeah. So uh, perhaps a, a quick summary for the listeners or a refresher for those who have kind of already read this, but maybe it's been a while. So the book kind of opens with uh, basically the death and subsequent funeral of Ivan Ilyich. And uh, basically shows a bunch of minor characters and they're all kind of milling around and they're almost inconvenienced by his death. And then it goes and tells the rest of the story in flashback, tells the life of this kind of just agreeable, somewhat mediocre judge who rises up through the ranks. Like you said, lives kind of this middle class lifestyle, is kind of obsessed with materialism, always lives beyond his means, never really gets what he wants. And then uh, through a just a complete minor accident, hanging drapes, I believe, he injures himself. And this causes a uh, basically escalating um, illness, disease, can't really be diagnosed. And then he has these, it's basically a feedback loop of increasing physical pain and mental anguish. And it drives him to his demise and he has to confront his own mortality. And so to your point of, you know, this feels like it could be something that could be written, you know, relatively recently. I mean, I read this and I just got fucking chills because I was like, man, the questions that this introduces are questions that I ask myself a lot. And holy shit, it's been, I don't know, 130 some years since this was written. And they haven't, they haven't changed. We haven't figured it out yet, man. Yeah. Like how, how mediocre and meaningless is my life? I think about, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I don't walk around thinking about that hard question, but I suppose in like little ways throughout the day, it pops up in my head. It's like, is, what is the point of what I'm doing right now? What is, what is the point of any of this? And I think that that's what caused him all the anguish really is that he, in, 
in, in some ways, when he's reflecting on his his life, there's there's nothing there. It, he's like, this is just what I was told to do, and I have to, I have to hold on to the idea that this is what I was supposed to do. And it's when he finally accepts that maybe this isn't what I actually wanted. Is when he kind of mm-hmm. is allows himself to quit hurting and die. Yeah, there's there's descriptions of he basically talks about how he realizes that. As he got older, he basically just, in a perfect linear progression, became less happy. Yeah. So, despite these accomplishments, it's kind of like that classic sort of idea or rule of thumb that once you get the thing, you realize you don't really want it anymore. Yeah. It was actually like the longing that was the important thing. Yeah, yeah. The desire to to, to achieve. Exactly. But then it, it takes on these these things that, I mean, just kind of hovering around this point that are no different now is just that, you know, there's, there's lots of like intertwined stuff with his relationship and his marriage, which is mostly unhappy. He kind of talks about early on that he basically got married because it was a favorable fit to a person just like him, really like his wife is so materialistic, just like he is. And she wants the exact same things. And I, I think at one point it even when he's dying, he he even kind of goes into how he he believes that it was like a marriage of convenience because they had the same vision on what they wanted in life. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly he realizes that. Well, I don't know if he he fully realizes who he's doing it for. Or oftentimes he's trying to figure that out. Is he doing it for himself? Is he doing it to sort of pacify his family? You know, what's what's the thing that's actually driving it? But. I felt like the which is kind of a kind of philosophical into, question, really. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, are you? <laughs> what, what, why do we do anything that we do? What's the proper? I mean, yeah. If you want to get into like personal questions that I ask myself all the time, it's what's the proper amount of the quote unquote shit, the garbage, the trash that you have to do on a daily basis that allows you to do what you want to do? Yeah. And is that the right? Is that the right balance? Did you get stuck because of some decision that you made 15 years ago that this is the best that it's going to be? Yeah. And that like, that terrifies the hell out of me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's horrible think, to think of ending up like poor even Iliac. <laughs> yeah. I was going back, um, kind of rereading parts of this uh, before we started chatting. And I realized, uh, sort of flipping back to, to how the book starts, is that... Um, you know, some other like shorter Tolstoy's that I've read have been like mostly linear stuff that happens just chronologically. And so I kind of, when I was starting to read this, I was like, oh, this is going to be a story where it's about a guy, but he's really not even in the book. He's more of a concept. That's where I was thinking it was going. Um, and then obviously it flips back and we see the whole, his whole life told chronologically in a flashback of sorts. Um, but what really struck me was how kind of flippant and inconvenienced and basically annoyed everyone around him was at his death. Yeah. And But then the biggest thing was just that concept that they all say that, well, it didn't happen to me. You yeah. Know, it's not, it's not, it's not my thing. It happened to someone else. I'm, I'm essentially not like that. So it's not going to happen to me in that same way. And going back and rereading that, because this is almost cyclical in a way, it was just like, Oh wow, that's that's almost like this tragic comic thing. Yeah. <laughs> because that's exactly how Yvonne felt, right? About everything in his life. Yeah. Is that it simply like other people were the ones that were fucking up and he was doing it correctly because he was always getting additional pay, additional levels of job grade, stuff like that. Yeah, which that that itself took me or that t- took a bit of co- um attention on my end because there isn't any flowery language it's kind of just laid out like that and i had to kind of stop a couple times and think about that because i think that i'm i'm that way i think that everyone i've ever known in my life is that way about a lot of things we are mostly selfish people or creatures thinking about you know what Mm -hmm. what can we do to keep ourselves alive (laughs) maybe there's like some inner biological trait that we all inherit but um there, there's sort of like that big philosophical question of what is beyond that, and is is there some sort of um, is there something bigger if we can sort of surpass that primordial instinct to um, find something larger in ourselves that we can be comfortable with, and maybe 
be comfortable dying because of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. I think there's like a human rule of thumb that it's hard for us to be taught something, but once we experience it, mm. then we understand. Sure. Right. And that's, I mean, that's how Fair, yeah. learning about others, that's how we build empathy. That's, that's like how we, how we truly learn. Right. Yeah. But th- that's why death is such a unique case because you can't learn. It only happens once. And once it happens to you, you can't communicate back. That's like the whole, yeah. that's the whole crux of the matter. Right. And so I think that's such a fascinating thing to explore is that it's really impossible for anyone to pass on the learnings of that because at some point at the very end he confronts it and he's like he's like ready for it yes yeah, like i think it's the last two pages or so that it's mm-hmm. um he just kind of accepts it he it's almost like he accepts that partially i think he accepts that he didn't do what he wanted and he he sort of i think it's when he's talking to his son his son comes in to talk to him and mm-hmm. cries and he identifies that the 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 kid loves him and the kid is grieving already um, because the kid identifies that his father is dying, which I think is the other than I think his name is pronounced Garrison. Other than Garrison, no one else will ever even acknowledge that Ivan Iliak is dying. He's the only one comfortable acknowledging it, which I think causes him so much pain. It's, it's almost a physical pain that it, or definitely a physical pain that comes from that. But when his, when his son comes in and identifies it, it's almost like it gave him permission from feeling like love from this child that like someone kind of says, I love you. He sees it and he believes it. And then he kind of just feels comfortable letting go. It's kind of in some ways like the first authentic emotion he's had in a while. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that Garrison's character kind of serves to primer up to that because Mm -hmm. Garrison's like a sort of a servant, maybe like a helper, almost like a hospice nurse that just kind of goes around and does some chores and cleans out his bedpan, brings him tea, uh, chops wood, and at one point starts to hold up his his legs on his shoulders because that's the only time that Ivan feels any uh, any relief from the pain that he's always um, plagued with. The character is always agreeable and always like wants to help and doesn't seem to be bothered by it. If anything, he reassures Ivan, like, this doesn't bother me. I want to help you because... We're all going to die someday. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like the, the only, the only, like, that's the first glimpse of a good person in the whole, the whole story. Yeah. And I, I was thinking about Garrison, uh, Russian novel pronunciations are always a mixed bag. I'm just going to throw it out. Yeah, there. it's tough. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah, there's, there's this little nugget in the first chapter that I noticed today where there's basically there's these banal exchanges between characters because they don't really want to be there. Even like uh, Ivan Ilyich's uh, wife goes from kind of this speech about how it was so tragic to immediately trying to figure out how she can improve his pension. Like, what's the amount of money I can yeah, get Yeah, she's of like crying, has a handkerchief to her face, and then moments later, okay, but how do I get a bigger grant out of this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's kind of setting the stage there, but I noticed that there's this interaction between Peter Ivanovich and Garrison, which goes, well, friend Garrison, said Peter Ivanovich, so as to say something, it's a sad affair, isn't it? Which is kind of a, it's a hollow question, essentially what he's throwing out yep. there. And Formality. then Garrison, yeah, Garrison responds, it's God's will, we shall all come to it someday. I think when I read that the first time, I was like, oh, well, this is this is actually just a banal exchange that has a banal answer to yeah, it. Yeah, more formal. Yeah, but what I realized this time is that Garrison is actually being authentic. Yeah. And he is saying the real thing because he's actually the only person who has kind of shared in this with, with Yvonne. Yeah, it's like every other character is just imitating Garrison's I don't know, something that Garrison is doing is, is real, whereas everyone else is just acting to be, to be that. Exactly. That really struck with me, like, especially trying to understand, I don't know, I, I thought that this might be more of a critique of um, basically, you know, kind of like society's behavior is one of those kinds of novels where there's kind of small nuances and misunderstandings. But I realized that that was actually kind of just a minor setting for it. What he's really laying out is just how much of a <laughs> not to get too dark but 
but a meaningless existence we all have until we're just completely staring down our own mortality. Yeah. Which is funny because I would have associated that sort of feeling with, you know, some of your classic existential writers, your Sartres and your Camus and, you know, who cares? Everything's meaningless. Let's, let's just go on with our lives. But I didn't really associate that question with Tolstoy. Because yeah, they were like, what, 40 or 50 years after this? They, yeah. So, yeah, probably 1940s-ish. Yeah. So, yeah. 60 years, yeah. Yeah, I think there's something interesting in what you were just saying also regarding Garrison, because I didn't catch that the first time I read it either. And when I was rereading it, I said, oh, I remember that name. Um, that's mm-hmm. the really nice guy uh, from later on, the only nice guy from later on. I don't know, maybe there's something in that about how if we do have this meaningless existence that, you know, we're all just going to have to trudge through, there are little bits of real things throughout it. We maybe just have to have to see them. And Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, that's a subjective uh, issue, but uh, to to see them and kind of accept them for what they are. I think there were times that I... I think at the beginning, I didn't understand why this Ivan Ilyich guy was supposed to be so bad. He just kind of seemed easygoing, like, yeah, he seemed like a fine guy, whatever, seems good. And mm-hmm. as time went on, I kind of started to understand the f- more broad scope of it. And it's like, oh, that yeah, this is, he's not a bad person, but he's uh, just indifferent to everything. Like, he's just like embodies the the feeling of indifference or the action of indifference, maybe. And to think that there's like other little characters woven in around him who aren't indifferent, who actually are striving to be good and maybe I don't, good is not necessarily the best word for that, but uh, maybe pure or wholesome or true, um, as such as Garrison was doing. There's something kind of profound in that, that it's easy to overlook without stopping to examine things. Yeah, I kept uh, I kept kind of transporting this into modern day. And it really, I mean, kind of your comment earlier, but it really feels like this could easily be a current day critique of materialism, all that stuff. Yeah. And, and like asking yourself, yeah, to what, to what degree are you willing to sort of ignore humanity and each other and community in order to achieve these things that, you know, the old adage, like you can't take it with you, right? <laughs> right, right. Like it's... <laughs> It's, it's going to stay here and you're going to, and you're going to depart. And I think that there is, I think he's laying that out, which is the, you know, the servant, the, the butler, the person of the lower class is oddly the person most capable of love. And it's not what, you know, it's not what you, <laughs> it's not what you own. Right. But it's what's on, sure. what's on the inside. And I, I kind of associate that with like, you know, more of like a, hey, we're in a post-industrial landscape. We're all competing to the death for each other. Like it's, you know, grab the money while you can. That kind of modern critique. But I just find it so comforting that that idea <laughs> was there before. And The, the Garrison I, idea. Yeah, the Garrison idea that like, you know, all this shit that you're accumulating really does get in the way, right? Yeah. But there has been people who have lived authentic lives with real emotions and they've 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 ignored all of the things that have distracted the rest of us and i think that's like such a powerful moral that i don't know like i don't, I don't want to like be uh you know over inflate this and say that like this book changed my life but it definitely like resonates in a, in a concept that i feel like it all benefits us to be reminded of absolutely it and I think that it's really interesting how it does that being so dense and with a, with such little flowery language. Like I think that generally the the flowery stuff is what makes me think in that way that you're describing. It makes my my mind wander to I don't know ponder existence. Sometimes because the flowery language is pretty, and I'm like, oh, that's so nice. I'm gonna daydream about that. But there's nothing pretty here. And I've been reading uh, Contact by Carl Sagan, which is um. Mm-hmm. Great, kind of a laid back thing. There's not a not a lot of um it's not necessarily compact whereas this is. And I think that I can I can just kind of sit back and read that and maybe drift off, fall asleep for a minute, come back, read more. Whereas with Ivan Iliac, I I can't drift off at all. There's just it's just too thought provoking. There's too much there's too much to to handle to relax. 
Yeah, it's kind of, I've decided that it's basically the novelization of Napalm's Death, You Suffer. <laughs> that's what I've, I've wrapped up in my head. How long is that song? <laughs> <laughs> well, just like that's a compact version of Napalm Death, this is a compact version of Tolstoy. Sure, sure. So, you know, the analogy works. But yeah, I mean, just, just that question of like, what, you know, what is suffering? Why do we suffer? Why, why do we deal with any of this? Um, I think is, is super profound. And then like, you know, it, it just, it leaves you both hollow, but also, I don't know, like I said, I keep coming back to that, like, like oddly comforting thing, which we always, uh, a concept we always talk about on this podcast is we, we tend to gravitate towards the more depressing things. Cause I think we, we find that they're interesting. If somebody, yeah. If somebody lays out a thing is how you're feeling and it's echoed back to you, you kind of, you don't feel as alone versus like other art is kind of escapist, right? It's meant to like pull you out of something and distract you in a way. Sure. But I've kind of always just like tell, like tell me the real thing. And like, that's, what's going to make me oddly enough feel good. Sure. Sure. I I guess I've never quite understood when people describe escapism in that way. Cause I, I kind of think of the real thing, like reading the real thing, like reading even Iliac is kind of, I mean, in a sense, it's kind of an it's escaping from normal everyday life, like the the routine. It, it kind of makes one think about something that, like, I don't go around all day long thinking about how to live a a, a true life so that I'm happy when I die. Maybe maybe little times throughout the day I think of that, but <laughs> I think that focusing on that in the book is is sort of an escape because it makes me think about that. I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm not thinking about riding spaceships through the sky and. I don't know, talking to sea creatures that actually live in Mars or something like that, but um, <laughs> which is maybe what people refer to when they say escapism. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think like that classic, like, uh, I don't know, like more fantasy oriented sure, things sure. Or, or even like, uh, you know, to use a musical analogy, like pop music, right? Like a thing that like taps into a certain part of your brain that kind of can distract you. Um, or injects this certain feeling sure. versus, I don't know, like, like I like your definition of escapism, which is kind of like escaping into this thing that leaves you these questions to ponder that, you know, you would have not had that if you didn't have this catalyst. Sure. Right? Yeah. You know, I think, I think both of us probably gravitate towards music that kind of does that as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a, it's definitely a good fit for that. <laughs> Which always blows me away when pop music can do it. Like, right. I think uh, I was listening to the Rolling Stones the other day, which is, I don't know, for all sakes and purposes, pop. Uh, what is the Moonlight Mile, I think, is the song. I think it's on the Sticky Fingers album. And it's just such a simple, standard Rolling Stones song. Like, there's not much conceptual depth, but just mm -hmm. that simple little message of, I'm I'm coming home. It's so nice. And I'm like, oh, and, and I don't know, as you're talking about escapism and pop, I was like, oh, maybe I can even find escapism in a, a very simple, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to be uh, contrary now, but. Contrarian with yourself to prove that it's not just all about <laughs> yeah. the darkness. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's an argument I have with myself all the time. So I completely identify <laughs> with that. Um, so one, one theory I wanted to like kind of put out there, because I asked myself, you know, as like Ivan Ilyich is kind of going into his uh, his later days and he's in more and more pain, he's in more anguish, there is this concept that um, his physical pain uh, irritates him mentally. But then also when he gets uh, irritated mentally, then he puts himself into more physical pain. And that event is kind of best like shown when he gets so frustrated at his illness that he tries to like physically change it he basically is like kind of what I view kind of punching and like pushing on what I think is kind of his broken organs. Ah, uh, sure. It's never really medically diagnosed. Right. But I, I kind of was asking myself is, is there an alternate reading of this? Is he actually not physically in pain? It is just the mental anguish of that meaninglessness that then like is embodied in this physical pain. And I think that's kind of an interesting thought exercise to work through. Yeah, yeah, because I would think that it seems like it starts off as being like an obvious physical thing, but as time goes on, he can start to make the pain go away. But as soon as he thinks about lies, I think in particular, like when his wife or his 
a daughter will come, or a doctor will come in and say, oh, maybe you should take this medicine. And he kind of just sees what they're doing as he, he's like, oh, they're lying to me. You know, they're uh, they're just trying to get this over with to, to put on airs that they care because they don't care. Um, mm-hmm. As soon as he identifies that in a person, it's like the pain just erupts inside of him and he starts feeling horrible and it, he gets really nasty to him. And he's like, go away. Let me die in peace. Which, of course, scares them and probably makes them want to be around him all the less. But uh, I think in that is when it, it because like, like you were saying, that's when it really gets unbearable for him is when he sees other people doing something. So it's almost a mental anguish as opposed to a physical anguish. And that, that was the thing that I, I don't know if I'm grasping completely about how he became ill. Because it seems like he falls, like like as you were saying earlier, he was hanging drapes and he falls and he kind of like... Mm -hmm. lands on something and kind of bangs up his side and he he comments when that happens he says oh you know if i was younger or if i was older this might have been a problem but good thing i'm not old good thing he's an athlete yeah good thing i'm an athlete and um (laughs) somehow that wound seems to have like (laughs) i'm no doctor but um it seems like that kind of thing doesn't actually cause death in a person over the next handful of months and or year Mm -hmm. so it seems like that the action because i think when he was hanging those drapes his family was off at the in-laws for like a period of time and he had bought this new house in the city that was the intent of that was to kind of elevate their social status to maybe look more accomplished more successful um Mm -hmm. which his wife and his daughter are both very in line with wanting to be that way and it seems like the injury that he sustains during that maybe is supposed to be portrayed as this is causing his illness. And then from that illness branches out that there's the physical side and the mental side that causes him to identify the the intellectual stuff that is actually what is killing him, I think. Mm-hmm. Like, it seems like that's actually the the villain here is the intellectual side of what he's kind of has just put in front of his face from this injury. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of like the reading of it that started to like build more in my head and like as we're talking about it, I'm like yeah, this is this is definitely the thing. It's just what he's been carrying all this time is so heavy, right? Or rather what he's carrying but he doesn't realize what he's carrying, which is kind of just that meaninglessness that as soon as that's like uh allowed to be injected or just like released a little bit inside him, that that's the thing that starts to take over. And I think that that's, I mean, there's there's kind of like actual medical conditions that um, I think they refer to as like amplified pain syndrome, which is basically that people feel more pain the more they focus on the pain. Mm. And then the body continues to build the pain and it gets to the point where people are feeling extreme levels of physical pain from like minor things like paper cuts and mosquito bites. Like and stuff literally like that. mind over matter. Exactly. And so like the brain is its own feedback loop, right? Yeah. And so not to say that Tolstoy was uh, trying to make, you know, medical arguments here, but I think like his awareness at how much like our frail human, (laughs) our frail human insides are like governed by these emotions and thoughts and and, and mental states. Yeah. Our perception sort of rules us. Yeah, exactly. And like we're, I mean, think about like, you know, modern times, like we're basically capable of convincing ourselves of anything or justifying anything. We being the, you know, the royal we, but sure. I'm sure myself as an individual, I do it all the I'm, time, right? I'm guilty as well. Yeah. So I think that that, again, I keep coming back to this concept of like it being comforting to know that like <laughs> basically the way that other people are quote unquote broken or struggling or something like that is a thing that... It's probably never going to be fixed throughout you know, like the human existence. At best, we can be aware of it and we can sit with it, but it's it's not something that's going to go away. And maybe through some sort of thoughtfulness and design to not let these things overtake us, then we can you know basically kind of minimize these the ability that our our frail human brains can push us into these paths. Sure, sure. The the unexamined life is is uh, not worth living, so to say. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> I uh, so I did want to read one passage, and it's like a little bit longer. But we're talking about the flowery language, and how this really isn't that. 
But there's this paragraph that really hit me that kind of brought in some of that emotional side. Because for the most part, I think this is oddly not that emotional of a book. But there's this one paragraph where he's trying to basically compare himself to an abstraction that kind of hit me emotionally. And so um, it's at the beginning of uh, chapter six. Okay. So it goes, um, the syllogism he had learned from Kisa Vedder's logic. Chaos is a man, men are mortal, therefore chaos is mortal. Had always seemed to him correct as applied to chaos, but certainly not as applied to himself. That chaos, man in the abstract, was mortal, was perfectly correct, but he was not chaos, not an abstract man, but a creature quite, quite separate from all others. He had been little Vanya with a mama and a papa, with Mitya and Vladya, with the toys, a coachman, and a nurse. Afterwards, with Katenka, and with all the joys, griefs, and delights of childhood, boyhood, and youth. What did Caius know of the smell of that striped leather ball Vanya had been so fond of? Had Caius kissed his mother's hand like that, and did the silk of her dress rustle so for Caius? Had he rioted like that at school when the pastry was bad? Had Caius been in love like that? Could Caius preside at a session as he did? Caius really was mortal, and it was right for him to die. But me, little Vanya, Ivan Ilyich, with all my thoughts and emotions, it's altogether a different matter. It cannot be that I ought to die. That would be too terrible. So there's some like there's some prose stuff in there that I think is impactful. It's that repetition of chaos over and over, but also just like they never really directly talked about those events in his life, right? But it is a really compact way that still uses my opinion like pretty great prose to instantly like evoke this feeling of like oh yeah we are all completely individual like anybody that's talking about mortality in an abstract way doesn't know about this one time that you know i made something cool in the sandbox they don't know about this emotion that i have like when i fell in love for the first time it's just impossible to really break that down and to document all of these completely independent real lives that we all live yeah which is just why nobody can tell you anything about death and mortality i mean you can certainly grieve you can certainly uh encounter it and come close to it um if you know people that have passed and such but like with respect to yourself it almost feels fake and that goes back to the original comment in the uh, beginning first chapter when they're just like, well, it wasn't me. Yeah. So so you think what he was doing here is sort of reflecting on or maybe acknowledging that there were times in his life. And and the example that he gives here is kind of focusing on the childhood of Caius. Um, So you're saying he's kind of reflecting in in an abstract way on his own childhood when he was happy. Yeah. He's basically, he's saying that, um, yeah, of course you can write in a book, you can put down some philosophy that, yeah, we're going to die. So that's just what it is. But, but that doesn't comprehend like these happy moments, these wonderful things. And so how can something so rigid as that yeah. coexist with the reality, which is this kind of pure human moment that exists throughout our lives. And that, I don't know, that one just really got me like thinking, cause I'm always trying to rationalize something and oftentimes would say that that's that's the response when we live in a world that has such high levels of tragedy and huge things going on that we really aren't capable of individually. Mm -hmm. So like a rational response is helpful, but at the same time, you have to remember that these are all individuals, right? They're all packed with all of these moments and how impossible it is to just have a rational abstraction applied to human life. It's just, it just doesn't work. Yeah, kind of in the way that I think we always say, I'm not sure where it comes from. We all die alone or however that's said. Like we all kind of live alone in, in a sense too. We all have our own experiences that we carry on and interpret in our own way and express in our own way throughout our lives. Mm-hmm. So a question, I guess, that we always kind of ask ourselves when we're reading these older books in modern days is, you know, where the title of the podcast comes from, is this of substance? Basically, it's more of like a, you know, do you recommend that people should be reading this book in the present day, I I would I would tell everyone to read it. It's you could read <laughs> it in a day if you want. It's really short. 
you could read it mm-hmm. at night if you want. Um, it's really, I guess it's really dense and it's really thought provoking. I, I think that I, uh, my mind has been wandering and racing ever since I read it. I, I think that it's, um, it's wonderful. It's great. I, I think everyone should read it. Yeah, it's kind of like the sweet spot between something that is so impactful and dense, but also digestible, which I feel like in our own modern existence, that like greatly increases the chance that somebody's going to consume it. Sure. Right? Because we have a million distractions and a million media options, right? So like making the argument for somebody to pick up some Tolstoy oftentimes feels like an uphill battle. Yeah. And I think that there's plenty of like philosophical reference to that sort of thing like i think i was thinking about his family and how they they come in and they talk to him just for a moment and they they're always so annoyed it's kind of like a formality they're doing the father of the family is just laying there dying and they kind of wander in and they say how are you feeling did you take your medicine oh i'm so sorry you're not feeling good and all the while he can see that they're they're so annoyed having to be there they don't want to they're on their way to a an opera or or -hmm. something and um and I think about like I think about cell phones in our in our lives, like how how often I'm having a conversation with someone and they I, I'm guilty of it myself, you know, check their phone really quick and then have to mm-hmm. answer a text message really quick, which I it, you know it, it's fine, but that's sort of a, that's something to think about. It I think that it very much applies to to everyday life for us now and the way that things are and how the little distractions we have that sort of take us away from honest, real interactions with people that, that can have substance. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically a lesson in how to be present and how to, you know, have some level of community and authentic interactions. Yeah. And, you know, if all goes well, love, right? Yeah. And I think that's, that's like, honestly, that's, that's timeless. That's Absolutely. why this stuff still, still hits. Absolutely. So, uh, so thanks for, you know, spending an hour of your, of your Saturday chatting about some old ass books. Yeah, thanks this for having a lot me. Of fun. And, uh, yeah, maybe, you know, we'll, uh, assign ourselves war and peace and reconvene in like, what, two years? Oh boy. Oh, that take to read? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to commit now, but I'm just saying <laughs> it could work. I'll start reading tonight. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thanks. Sure. Thank, thank you. Thanks for listening. You can check us out at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Twitter and Instagram with the handle booksosubstance. You can find more on Bellwitch at bellwitchdoom.net. And also, while I have you, it's a very difficult time for independent music right now due to COVID-19. If you have the means, please buy records or donate to venues that are closed indefinitely. Every little bit really does help. fucking riding horses there's like a farm (laughs) this isn't gonna be interesting this is dumb and then like oh they're gonna have tea again great